Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. Today, we have Dr. Linda Pettit and Natasha Swerdloff with us. Mm -hmm. um, Linda assists her clients in finding wisdom for moving gracefully through life's challenges and transformative change. She utilizes her 35 plus years of clinical experience as a psychologist and 14 plus years sharing the three principles to inform the spiritual nature of her work. Linda works with the general public. She also provides professional mentoring to three principles practitioners around the world. Both alone and with her husband, Bill Pettit, Linda provides four day intensive cons consultations to individuals and couples who want an in-depth experience of exploring the three principles. Currently, Linda is also offering a series of small group programs online for women entitled Life as Spiritual Theater. She's writing a book tentatively entitled Mystical Medicine, How Love Heals. And Linda's website is thedoctorspettit.com, and I'll post um, all of this underneath the YouTube video when it's up. Natasha lives in Denmark, although is right now in L.A., <laughs> and has been self-employed since 1996, specializing in coaching, leadership training, organizational change, communication, facilitation, and process consulting. She has a widespread experience as a consultant on a managerial level, <laughs> and has been a part of a range of successful changes in organizations in Denmark and abroad. Natasha has co-authored the book, Coming Home with Dr. Ditton, Dicken Bettinger, and and she now teaches seminars and speaks at conferences all over the world about the three principles. Natasha is married to John and enjoys spending time with, with friends, family, cooking, gardening, being in nature, traveling, and riding her Harley Davidson in the summertime. <laughs> Natasha owns the Principles Institute, and you can see more about her and her work and watch videos at theprinciplesinstitute.com. So, um, I am so pleased to have both of you here on a webinar again. We did one with you before and it was so much fun. So thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Bonnie. And thank you for hosting us again. I, I think it's almost to the date, the same time as last year that Linda and I was on. It was like the 13th, the 14th, the 15th of February. And uh, at that time, Linda and I were together in Phoenix as we were doing a women's group there at her home. So it marks the year of our last webinar. And um, the topic for, for this webinar, we were both inspired by like, what are we looking for? What are people looking for? And, and um, what, what I find in my work is there's something that's, that whether whichever words people are using to describe what they're looking for, it seems like there's something that's kind of the same. It's, um, they might use the word, uh, oh, I'm looking to be successful, or I'm looking to have peace, or be recognized, or whatever <clears throat> words they're using. And, and, and sort of when I start questioning what lies beyond that, there's something, there's a feeling that everyone seems to be looking for. And that's kind of what we wanted to explore today. What is it that we're looking for? And um, in my preparation for, for this with Linda, uh, we were looking at different quotes from, from Sidney Banks as we both get so inspired by looking back into the work, work that he's done. And, um, and I found a, a quote that I wanted to start with, um, which, he, which he wrote in um, the, the Quiet Mind. And the quote is, we're searching for a silent mind. It's in the silence of the mind that all the secrets of life are found where all happiness is found. And the second you open that door, you find a new level of consciousness. It is a must. Life must become more beautiful. And I just, I just love that quote. We're looking for a silent mind and, and we might have different words to explain what that, what that looks, um, what that looks like, but there's a feeling in it that seems to be something that we all are looking for. So it's, we're looking for a feeling in a sense. And, and Sid also said that there's no real words in the English language that describes that feeling, but it's a feeling of, we would maybe call it contentment or joy or um, a 
peaceful feeling. Uh, we can all have our, our different words that we use to describe it. And now this feeling, this, this space that we're looking for, this silent mind, it's one of the confusions that I, that I see in the clients that I have or in the seminars that I teach is that people are confusing where to look for it because it can seem as if and society kind of dictates that it's something that we find by being successful or getting that house or getting that special one and only. Um, so there's, there's all this pressure from society in a way to, to look in a certain direction, which is outside of ourselves. And people do all sorts of things to find this, this silent mind. Um, I just uh, spent some time in Costa Rica with, with Dick and, and, uh, and he had his wife Koisi with and I had my husband John with and we spent time at the beach and it was so interesting watching the surfers um, and, and I had a chance to speak with one of them again I said what are you what, what is it that you love about surfing and he, he said exactly that he said when I catch a wave and it's just going there's this flow there's this feeling of just being completely present <laughs> i'm not a surfer myself but i i imagine that thinking about my grocery list or problems that i have while i'm catching a wave is not going to work very well so there's there's something about that sense of just being completely present falling out of of, of thinking that allowed him to be in this state of just peace silence whatever he called it um i sometimes play golf in the summer times and, and it's the same thing i wouldn't hit anything if i was trying to think about uh what i was doing i would that would go really badly um it can be for some people like i when i travel in big cities i love going into churches just sitting there just kind of letting myself fall out of my thinking just being present it can be in prayer. It can be, if I see something beautiful, the beauty in Costa Rica is just incredible. Looking at um, flowers, uh, the wildlife, um, the way the sun catches a branch and the sunlight kind of goes through the green, that kind of just stops me in my tracks and I just go, oh, wow. And in that moment, there's this feeling of, wow, of awe, of um, there's no thinking. It's, it's dropping out of thinking into a feeling. Now, the confusion could be that if I think that I have to be in beauty, I have to be outside to be in this feeling, then I will become addicted to whatever it is I think is giving me the feeling. If I think it's the surfing, then I can become addicted to surfing or golf. Uh, it can be drinking. There's, so there's all these different things that all of us do differently that allows us to drop out of our, out of our thinking for a moment and get into that just, ah. Oh. The thing is, and this is the beauty, it's already there. Just like Sid said, the silent mind is already present with us. It's just beneath what we're thinking. It's always just underneath what's coming and going constantly. So our thoughts come and go, our feelings come and go, it, it changes constantly. But there's a presence, there's a silence that's beyond our thinking. There's, a, there's an awareness that's always aware of what's coming and going, that's perceiving the coming and going of our thoughts and our feelings. So in that awareness is the present moment. It's, it's, it's not even, it's not a time in, in space, it's, it's simply the now, the deep now. You ever notice we're always right here, right now? But the thing is, we get caught up in our thinking about, no, I have to do this, I have to reach that goal, and I want to go in that direction. And it feels as if, and it seems as if it takes us out of the present moment. So one of the things that Linda and I wanted to, to um, point towards today is, is this, this space within, this whatever we want to call it, this silent mind that's present beyond thinking, beyond what we're experiencing. It's always right here, right now, whenever we fall out of our thinking. So I think I'll, I'll stop here and hear what Linda has to say. 
Uh, thank you, Natasha. I'm just delighted to be here in this space with you and with everyone else. I loved what you said about the silent mind. We both really were touched by that, those words that Sid put forward and your comment that the silent mind is always with us. And I know that when I am working with people, having conversations about the three principles with them, often it's with people who have never heard of them before or are just very new to it. And they will say, but my mind is never silent. And I often will ask them to describe a time to me when they were really enveloped in a feeling of love. And people will go different places. Sometimes they'll talk about, well, when I, when I hold my baby, I just have this extraordinary feeling of love. Or, or when I'm out with my pet running in the pet, pet field, uh, I have this extraordinary feeling of just loving. Or when I'm with my partner and uh, we're just cuddling each other in bed, or maybe we're being sexual, I'm just in this extraordinary feeling of love. And, and I just say, well, you know, those are examples of a quiet mind because that's what happens when our minds is, are quiet. We're just flooded, flooded by love. A deep feeling of love. And, and I must say, when, when Natasha and I first talked about this program, we came up with this title and description it felt kind of right and then I found myself as I was getting closer and closer to today feeling a little uh, I don't know almost unnerved and not not sure what that was about and so I just sat with it because I thought gosh sometimes when I, when there's that feeling of I don't know something just not sitting right it's I'm on sacred ground it, it's an opportunity to just slow down be quiet listen within and, and see what comes up. And, and I, I, I realized that a lot of my life um, prior to learning the three principles was about trying to help people find their purpose and live on purpose. And, and that, that I had searched for some understanding of what the purpose was to life, especially in times when life got dark, when there were significant challenges in front of me. And now, and I know that the three principles understanding has really contributed to this. Now, when I look back across my 65 years, I realize that there was never a point when I wasn't on purpose, that, that I was right where I needed to be. And in those moments when I was flooded in love when I when I just showed up the I that I really am the I that Natasha spoke of that's in the silent mind that's always behind our thinking that love just flooded from me and it showered anything I was doing in the moment and there were other times when I couldn't necessarily feel that love my thinking was heavy or I was really gripping it to me and, but even in those moments, there were lessons to be seen. There were lessons to be viewed. And as soon as they would come through, the beauty would flood back. I spend a lot of time right now with my 20 month old grandson. I have him with me every Friday. Bill and I just enjoy that day. And we, and especially me, I, I because I do this in my schedule, I just put everything aside and, and I'm just with him, just present, just playing, just listening, just watching to see what he looks at, seeing the world through his eyes as much as I can, knowing that I don't know what he thinks, but, but I can look and notice where his consciousness goes. And that is such a beautiful thing that love just floods through and is felt in that connection with him. And I, I really feel in that moment that, that this is the purpose of life to, it's the only purpose worth looking for is, is to show up and be in the moment in love. 
and I had a really big lesson with that this past year. I, I had a knee replacement six months ago and it went very well. And the first two weeks afterward were pretty cool. I thought, wow, I can do this. I don't even need a lot of medication. And, and I'm just, you know, moving forward. I can already walk and look, I can drop my cane and I don't have to use the walker. And, and then about two and a half weeks in when all of the anesthesia from the surgery and all the guards they had put even in the knee to prevent me from experiencing pain wore off. And suddenly I got hit with more pain than I knew it was physically possible for a human being to experience. And I was humbled and found myself in the moment at times writhing, just writhing with nerve pain, thinking, I can't do this. I can't experience this. I can't go on with this. And of course, my mind would go a little, my brain would go a little crazy. You know, what if this is the way life is for the rest, rest of time you're here? But I also saw something uh, really profound in those moments. I, I really saw that I wasn't alone in that, that, that it, I could feel the energy of something behind me simply with me, uh, holding me, and uh, a feeling, a deep feeling of love for myself in that moment flooded through. And it was, it was really very beautiful uh, to just be in that space and, and to know that I could love myself and hold the experience and see something beautiful even in that. Uh, I don't know that I would have had the capacity to do that with as much grace as I do now because of this three principles understanding, because it... has pointed me to truth. And because it has given me a certain certainty that even when I, at the human level, can't see something, that, that certainty that, that, that it is there, that, that that energy that I am is always with me because I am it, uh, will take me through even the most difficult times. And so I look back at that and I think, wow, that was a moment of beautiful experiencing of purpose. I, I was curious about the word purpose and this fact that I had this little resistance to it and I looked it up in the dictionary and I always love looking at the root words of things. My husband Bill has taught me to always look to the Latin and uh, was interested, interested to discover that the root word of purpose is really to put forward and I thought wow that, that just kind of it for me says it all that we're, we're here to put forward in every moment, love. And anytime we're doing that, and even when we're not, when we're momentarily in our thinking and not feeling the love, there are always lessons to be seen, doors to be opened that take us back to that place. I jump in? Yeah, please do, Natasha. Oh my gosh, that was so beautiful. I got all quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I haven't looked at the, the word purpose put forward. Uh, but I, um, And it made me realize that it's one of the things that when we're, when we're doing well, when people are in a, in, a, in a good place, that's what we do, don't we? We, we put forward love. Anywhere in the world that I travel, people who are poor or sick, or if they if they if they have a, if they have well-being inside, they're generous, they're helpful, they're kind, they're compassionate. There's something in this love that that comes comes out of us that's put forward um, when we're in a when we're in a good uh, when we're when we're in our well-being and. It's, 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 it, it, I, I love that it's so universal. Mm. Um, and I love the, that love is, it's such a good example of something that we can't explain. There's no, 
everybody has a sense of love, but it's but it's like it can be love for 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 a pet or a hobby or that. But love is itself is like, why do you love someone? Can you make a list? No, right? Why do you love Luke, your grandson? You just you just do more than anything, yeah. right? Like I love my grandchildren too. It's just so. I work very similarly to you, um, Linda, when I work with people who said, oh, there's no silence ever. It's like constant 24-7 blabber. But then there's always, you can always kind of point to, so do you have children? Do you recognize the time when you're sitting with your child and you're not having the blabber? And, and they usually do. They're, there's always something you can find where they actually do have a sense of this silent mind, even for, for an instant. And that's always so interesting to, to point to and have them kind of taste that, even for a moment, because once they've seen that that's actually with them, without them doing anything, then it's, it's, it's more, it becomes more familiar and then they can keep coming back to that space. Um, so we're not really talking about, you know, being quiet. You can have a silent mind, because it, it, it is silent, but it's, it's, you can have talking or noise around sometimes people say oh i i can't po possibly have a silent mind at my office because there's you know hundreds of people around me but there's a silence that be that's beyond the quiet and that's that's the deep sense of of stillness that we have inside and it's it's a presence it's a silence it's a stillness and there's no doer of it there's no creator of it Right? We, might, we might think, oh, I have to create or do something. What are the five steps that I need to take to create the silence? There's no doer of it. So sometimes we look for something outside. We look for, we look for this silence in our relationships or in our uh, work or in our hobbies or through substances or, you know, whatever, whatever we're, we try to find this silence that there's no doer of. So we're looking in the world of objects very often to find something that isn't an object. We're looking in the wrong direction. That which we're looking for is formless. Silence is formless. So there's no thing in the world we can do. There's nothing to, there's nowhere to go to find something in, a, in, a, in an objective world that's actually out of us in the formless. It's also one of the things I love that, 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 that you and Bill speak about often, Linda, which is that there's nothing broken. Well, no, because what we are is formless. How are you going to break something that's formless? Like in the room that I'm in right now, this is just space. Even if I took a knife and I started stabbing in the space, nothing would happen to the space because it's formless. I can take an object in here and smash it and it would break and I'm sure Carrie would not be happy about that. But um, So only objects can break. Our true essence, who we truly are, is unbreakable because it's not an object. And that's so beautiful and that's so powerful and that's one of the things that I know both Linda and I love talking to people about, pointing towards, because when people see that, just like Sid said, life must become more beautiful. It must, because you start realizing your true essence. You start realizing that you are something that is formless. And it can be difficult to see because we have this form, right? It looks like I'm in this body. I look out of these eyes, so it looks like there's a form. And I can certainly break. I mean, my physical body can break, like Linda's knee, but, <laughs> right? I mean, so our physical bodies can break, sure. But nothing is ever going to be broken in, in our souls, in, in our true essence. That is the, the formless nature that we have. I, I like to be inspired by poetry. As often it will be said, but sometimes it will be poetry. And I was reading this, this 14th century mystic this morning. It's a, a woman named Lala. Hmm. And, she, and she wrote, um, I have traveled so far seeking God but it was only when I gave up and turned back that I found him within me. So it, 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 for, for, for me, and, and I'm sure many of you out there, there's this 
traveling out into the world, trying to seek something in the world of objects, in relationships, and activities, in substances. The, and, and all I'm trying to do is, is to look for that, that feeling, that knowing. There's, there's, with love comes a knowing of it. How do you know you love somebody? There's a knowing of it. And that knowing, that just, it's, it's when, I, when I sense that in myself right in this moment, it's, this, it's just very pleasant, <laughs> a knowing of love. It's, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep feeling. But I've certainly searched for it outside of myself for, for the longest time. So what Lala is saying, it's, it's not until I, I turned back and came back to myself that I found we can call it a lot of things, but, but found myself, found my essence, found my true nature, found a silent mind. It's, it's right within. So a lot of years spent looking in a, in, a, in a place where it cannot be found because it's not an object. Yeah, Linda. <laughs> yeah. Natasha, I, I, I love that you keep pointing back to going within and the formlessness that we're all, that we all are in the form. And I was reminded of the call you and I had a couple of days ago where we were preparing for this webinar and we found ourselves talking about peace. And I said to Natasha, oh, you know, lots of people talk about the fact that what we're looking for is peace, but I don't relate to that. And, and I said, part of it is that when I think of peace, what I think is that uh, the absence of conflict. And sometimes when I am living from love and doing what I see to do from a place of love, the results of that on the external world can be very conflicted because it sometimes asks me to fly in the face of conventional wisdom or rules or dogma or ritual or expectations that others have. And uh, Natasha and I looked at, well, uh, the place we're pointing toward, the best we can do is offer words for it. And, and I said, yeah, maybe love is closer for me, or maybe awe. You know, we, it was just fun to play with the words. But again, <laughs> and, and if my husband Bill listens to this, he's gonna just chuckle. Because every time, often, every, practically every day, he gets tickled by a word and he'll say, What's the Latin root of that word? And I just want to, uh, not again. But I went, I went back to the dictionary <laughs> to look at peace, to see what the root word of peace was. That would be really fascinating to know. And I found this very interesting, that the root word of peace is actually refers to two things, to join or to fasten uh, to a boundary to join or to fasten to a boundary. And I, that suddenly felt right to me that that's what I've been looking for all of my life is, is to be joined or fastened to that boundary between the formless and the form, the spiritual and the psychological, to be sitting as close to that with my ear in silence, listening for what wants to come forward because it's in that place that whether it's an ordinary or extraordinary the beauty of life becomes so much more apparent i was also i was also struck that we you know natasha and i talked about looking within you know, what what exactly does that mean and I, I tend to think of it as looking inside of my own my own consciousness and and i think i see more and more that it's really pointing us to look inside the entire consciousness of life the entire oneness of life for what we see or what can be seen to bring forward love in the moment. I've recently been fascinated by a place in the 
I think, I think it's in Quest of the Pearl, where Sid is talking about Alexander Graham Bell uh, seeing the telephone. And he says something like, there was this moment where Bell's mind fell silent just for a split second and a pathway was cleared for spiritual intelligence and Bell saw his beloved telephone. And I found myself riveted by that and just looking at that and, and, and I thought, oh my gosh, I think I've always had this kind of thought that somehow the telephone was already out there in consciousness. <laughs> and suddenly the pathway was cleared and some being behind life suddenly handed the telephone to Alexander Graham Bell. I know that sounds a little crazy, but I think a lot of my, my religious understandings of God sometimes get in the way of me seeing, really trying to see beyond the form. And it suddenly occurred to me that what I think Sid was talking about was more of a sense of in that moment of the silent mind, Bell had a split second connection with a, a knowing beyond the form, behind the form that allowed him to put together all kinds of information that he had and and maybe a knowing before the form that had not yet been born and suddenly see something fresh and new. And then that became part of the entire consciousness. That invention became part of the expanding universe and has affected the expanding universe. Who knows how it will continue to affect this expanding universe. I've always been fascinated by the lives of inventors of big things, but on a, on, a, on a little Linda scale, that struck me as so beautiful. And I began to realize how much my life matters and how much your life matters. Because every moment we have those split seconds of silence and we're able to see and bring together something new into the world, something fresh, something original. And it can be as small as figuring out how to love a particular child or how to, how to respond to a checkout counter cashier who's nasty to us and maybe is in a bad moment. It can be really tiny and it can be really big. But every time we bring forward something from that spiritual intelligence, and we'll know it because it's always grounded in that deep, beautiful feeling of love. We bring beauty into the world and that beauty matters. And we can never know how much, even in those really tiny moments, we have affected the evolution of consciousness for the entire world. And that, uh, that just brings me to my knees in a really beautiful way. Okay, all I have to do is show up in every moment and do my best to be quiet and let love move through me. And then at the end, when I flatline, my life will have been full of purpose. Wow. So that that's, that conversation we had really sparked a lot of reflection for both of us. Didn't yeah. it? <laughs> yes. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. We're, we're we're all the same. That the oneness that Sid spoke about in his in his enlightenment experience. That oneness. We are one ecosystem. We're one. We're one. And of course. The, the, the consciousness of when, when love becomes, when I have more love in my life, I'm going to affect the entire system. Mm -hmm. The more loving I am, the more love is being 
brought forth in the entire system. So I can sometimes I work with people who are, who are severely depressed and are sitting at home and, and can't go out and they really want to, they have in their heart, they want to be of help and service to the world, but they are too um, boggled down by, by their thinking. And I always say to them, you can do as much sitting at home on your couch as, as I hopefully am doing by traveling around the world. There's, there's, there is nothing more in, in traveling around or than sitting at home because there is one consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I remember also a story that I heard about Sid where, where he said, oh, I can, I can do as much for the world sitting at home, having a cup of tea in my garden as of doing a talk in front of 200 people. And that's really understanding that we are one system. Mm -hmm. That the beauty that and the love that I experience in me goes into that entire system. Mm -hmm. That is that is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So there really there really isn't anything to do or or anywhere to go. It's not if if life calls that from us. If we do feel this moving forward, this purpose is which it, it, it is clearly for me to I want to speak to people I love doing these webinars and and trainings and coaching and all these things it's it's the way that wisdom seems to be moving me and it could also be sitting at home being in my garden going on my motorbike being with my husband and my friends it's uh there's this celebration of life that comes that can come through when I don't make expectations and lists and set goals. <laughs> like every time I make a list of something that I want to do, it kind of puts me in my head and, and, and away from my heart. And when I don't have lists, when I don't have expectations of life or John or my friends, then we can just celebrate life together. I can't wait to have Linda and, and her husband Bill come to Denmark in a few months and and uh, spend some time with, with me and John and also do a, a beautiful training there. So um, celebrating life and love together um, with, with a whole group of people, it's just, it is really a way of bringing forth love in the world, raising the level of consciousness, healing the world, which, um, which, is, which is really wonderful. I was, I was uh, speaking with a client a couple of days ago. She was talking about a uh, relationship and uh, her partner and how she had expectations of him. And, uh, and I said something in the lines of when you have expectations of somebody, do you believe that your, your, your peace of mind, your happiness is coming from that other person and you start making expectations, they will feel that pressure to make you happy. It's like a belief that both people can come into. Now I have to make you happy and you have to make me happy. And, and if you're sad, it's my fault and if, and so on. And it becomes this pressure and it kind of, it kind of stifles life. You, you become stuck. And I said to her, do you remember when you fell in love with your partner? And she said, yeah. I said, did you have any expectations? She said, no. I said, that's, that's, that's where to look. Love doesn't have a list. Love doesn't have expectations. So when I find this space inside, this, this peace of mind, this silent mind, this, this content feeling, whatever we, we, we choose to call it in ourselves or God, when I find it in myself and I don't put expectations for anything or anybody to give it to me, then I'm free. And the other person is free. Now, my husband, John, doesn't, doesn't, I don't expect him to make me happy. And if I'm feeling sad, that's not on him either. And what that means is that we're both free to celebrate life together. And we love it. We love being together, traveling together. It's not that we smile every day. It's not that we have our ups and downs like everyone. But it doesn't come from the other person. Neither are ups or our downs. So there's this, there's this, dance and celebration of life that can come through when we don't get stuck in our thinking about what should be and what could be and how we want it to be and uh, how if I strive enough and I uh, have enough steps uh, where, I, where I can go.
it shifts right here, right now, always. And sure, I forget that. I, I forget that. And then I remember. And, and when I remember, it, sometimes it takes a little while until the bubbling feeling of life comes through me again, but it, but it, it, it always does. And the knowing of that, that is beautiful. The, the knowing that without a shadow of a doubt, that always is there uh, in, in, the, in the deep part of my own being. And there's nothing that I have to do. It's a beautiful reminder. I'm really touched as I listen to you, Natasha, about how relaxed I start to feel, just sort of chilled out and I take a deep breath and, and just be in the moment with you. And I, I, I had a thought that my friend, Marianne, who's on this call, uh, sent me a Valentine's Day card. And in the card, she wrote, your future is so bright, you need sunglasses. <laughs> When I read it, I just laughed. I loved it. And I think how true that is for all of us. That and and that what you said about Sid sitting, that saying that that he could do as much good sitting with a quiet cup of tea on his patio, which he did often, uh, as he could speaking in front of 200 people. You know, that says something to us. That's something for us to look at. That that the brightness in our future may be that moment where we are sitting on our patios just in awe of the palm trees or the pine trees or whatever it is we see when we go out on our patios because that feeling of great gratitude for beauty that wells up that feeling of awe and appreciation for beauty that wells up that that is what the divine is. I, I was thinking the other day that Sid talks so often about being grateful, that great gratitude was a shortcut. And I suddenly had this thought, yeah, it's a shortcut to the divine because it is the divine. It's another way of, of pointing to that beautiful feeling of the divine. And that divinity is grateful for me. It's grateful for me. It's grateful for every one of you because it gets to know itself through our eyes in the physical world. Yeah, that's kind of a beautiful, beautiful thought. Yeah, I love what you just said, Linda. Um, that God gets to experience its own divinity through our divinity. We're 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 in the world of form, and and we're also form the formless. But through everything that we're experiencing, there's this there's something experiencing that there's there's a, the knowing of the experience that is always present and that knowing is god that knowing is our own consciousness we're not apart from god it's not a, a being that's apart from us it's 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 ourselves and through the i sometimes think about you know everything in the world being so diverse and and uh, look we look different and we feel different and we have experiences that are different but there's there's something that's exactly the same which is the knowing of it the knowing of the experiences and that knowing of it is pointing towards that which is always present always there god divinity the formless it's not it's it, it cannot be gone even if I, if this, there was a point in time where this room that, that I'm in right now, where the walls were not here, but the space was here, and there probably will be a day where the, the walls will be gone again, and the space is not going to be, it's going to be gone, the space will still be here. So there's something that's always here. Our own divinity is always here, even if the body isn't. Our body is a, an object, it's, it's, it's 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 a form but there's something that's 
doesn't come and go, which is the formless. It's always going to be present. So I, for me, it's so beautiful to look at what's, what doesn't come and go, what can't come and go, what is always there. What, what is it that's always giving of itself? And for me, the generosity that life gives us by constantly bringing us forth, that generosity is love. Mm. And so for, for me, when, when we are generous with our time or, or our money or our, our just being helpful to another human being, um, there's this, we, we kind of, we're more like God ourselves. We, we become one with who we truly are. So I find in myself that when I'm, when I'm generous in, in one way or another, there's, there's, a, there's a joy in that that doesn't come from, oh, did anybody see that I uh, gave uh, some money for this, to this person? Or, it's not that. There's just a joy in knowing that I'm of service. There's a, there's a generosity of spirit that just feels so loving. And, and it can be just a kind word. It doesn't even have to be money or time. It's just, just acknowledging somebody. Or So there's something in, in being in, 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 a, in alignment with the generosity of life itself, in the generosity of, of the divinity, that whenever I am in that space, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's, 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 it's the only place that I, that I want to be. Um, and I'm not always there, but um, it certainly feels good when I am. And I was, I was um, thinking, Natasha, why aren't, you know, we, we're sort of waxing on about how beautiful it is to be with our, <laughs> our ear close to the formless because we know as does everybody here, how wonderful it feels to be in that place of beauty and love. So why aren't we there all the time? And it was really interesting. And my life is there a spiritual theater program, which is, I think I'm running through it the second time. When we get to the fifth week where we're talking about forgiveness, that this thing comes up in conversation that uh, people reflect on, that it's so much easier to see beauty and love and to forgive others than it is to see it in ourselves. It, it is so much easier to forgive others than it is to forgive ourselves. At least that's what the participants talk about a lot. And I certainly relate to that. And, and I, I got a little glimpse into to that this a couple of weeks ago, I was outside with my 20 month old grandson and suddenly he became obviously frightened and terrified and so much so that he was would didn't want to look at me or and he was hiding behind a tree and he was desperate to get back in the house and I was completely clueless to understand what had happened and just spent a good bit of time trying to comfort him until he got through it and it happened again a week later when he was with me and I, I really just tried to look and see what he was seeing. And I suddenly noticed that he kept glancing over his shoulder. And I realized, oh my goodness, he's frightened of his shadow. He's frightened of my shadow because it's enormous. And it looks like it's going to completely overtake him. And that's why he keeps glancing over at it. And that's why he keeps running aimlessly because no matter where he runs, he can't can't get away from it. And I, I said, and the funny thing was that that night I was telling Bill, I figured out what Luke was so frightened of. And he said, you'll never believe this, but a friend of mine just sent me a little video from the internet on YouTube that shows children being frightened of their shadows. And it was meant to be funny, but as we watched it, it was not funny. These children were just terrified. But I suddenly had this like, oh my gosh, you know, I had this extraordinary sense of the vulnerability of being human. That here's this little 20 month old, he's starting to have a lot of thinking. He can't tell the difference yet between what a rational thought is and what an irrational thought is. 
And so it all feels the same to him. And so, and, and he doesn't have understanding about what a shadow is. And so it, there's this sense of being really frightened by it. And I really saw, wow, it makes perfect sense that we throughout our lives develop a lot of thinking about ourselves, that we're not enough, that there's a lot to be frightened of, that someone's always gonna be bigger than us, that we're not worthy. There's so many things we can't do when we're teeny tiny that as we look around at the bigger kids and bigger adults around us, it seems like they do easily. So that, that we all kind of develop this personal thing, whatever you want to call it, our personal thought system that, that beats us up, that doubts our worth, that is pushing us to be worthy by having a purpose, whatever. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And, and it is the ordinariness of that and the kind of humor in that, that that's just part of the experience of growing from tiny to big that, that kind of helps me be gentle with myself when I'm not in that place that we are kind of glowingly describing as beautiful to be in, but instead are momentarily frightened by our thinking or, or gripping our thinking. It, 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 it brings sort of a, just a sense of compassion for, for our vulnerability and a knowing that it's, it's not hard to get back to that place of love. It just takes seeing thought, seeing thought. It's as simple as that. I was wondering, Linda, should we ask if there's some questions out there? Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I love that you kind of went into the this, well, why don't we see it all the time? You, you <laughs> and I certainly know from our conversations, Linda and I'll be on the phone with each other sometimes, like, I'm so stuck right now. <laughs> you know, it, it, we, 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 uh, we are, even though we're speaking about this beautiful space, we're certainly not beyond being stuck in our thinking and um, I'm certain that there's a lot of you out there that feels like I like we do so uh, if there's any questions we'd love to hear from you I can see someone on a phone unmuted themselves I have a question can you hear me yes this is Paul Gastold from Toronto I my, my question is sometimes the thinking that um, covers up that feeling of divinity in me, that connection is thinking that I need a partner. <laughs> and um, any, any, any thoughts on when some particular, you know, idea like that um, kind of runs, runs circles around itself and how do you find to fall back into a connection with something um, that's true. Do you want to tackle that one, Natasha, first? Yeah, I, I, I can. I can give it a. <laughs> I, well, Paul, um, great question, and, and it's so. I, I, you know, there's versions of that from so many people believing that there's something outside of yourself that can give you the love that you probably long for, the connection, the, the, the sense of, of being one, um, is, is looking in, in the wrong direction. There's, there's nothing out there, there's no partner that can give you love, that can give you connection, whatever it is that you're looking for a partner for. It can also be the companionship, you know, the, all these wonderful, wonderful things that um, a relationship can give. But if, if, if the, if, so seeing, how thought creates this in you, this, oh, there, there's something that I must have and I don't want to be lonely. It's as if one of the things that happens when we go from this beautiful space of being born and being one with everything, like, like Linda was explaining with her grandson, he's in now and in, in coming into the world like, oh, this is good and this is bad. Or, oh, there's a shadow. It's scary. There's something that's 
So we, it's like we, as we grow up and we start to think, we learn that there's things that are bad, we don't want the bad things, and there are things that are good, we should go towards the good. And so it becomes this away from the bad and towards the good, looking outside of ourselves. So seeing that that's what's happening, that's all that's happening, it's, it's looking in a direction where it's, it's not going to give you anything. Even uh, when you do find a partner at some point, there's, there's this short period where, oh, I got what I was looking for. And then it isn't. So it, it really looks as if when we get whatever, it can be a partner, a job, or a house, or some sort of career, um, win a race, whatever it is, what it looks like we'll, we're looking for, when we get it, there is a short moment where, it, where we get this, oh, I got it. But because it's in the world of form, it doesn't last. We're looking for something out there that's, that's never going to last because it can't. Anything in the world of form cannot last. So, so when you start looking within, finding the love that you already have, already are, the connection to everything, not just one, but everything, when you have this fullness in yourself, that's when you feel like, oh, I can, I can actually be alone the rest of my life, and that's, and that's fine. That's uh, often the, the time that people actually do find a partner. Because who wants to be responsible for your happiness? Right? We don't want that kind of responsibility. So when you're free from that desire of someone else, that's the time that you're most attractive. So, so I, I, I sometimes when there's a feeling of there's something lacking in my life, I'm like, well, what, what is that? What is that belief that I have behind that there's something that I should have? And when I see that, like just when I see that, that it's thought, it's the formless power of thought that's creating that experience in me. When I see that truly and deeply, I fall back into this, this formless space of love and knowing. And that's, that's a really a, a wonderful place to, to, to be in the world. That was my little go with that. I loved what you said about uh, Natasha about when you when you most are in this place of contentment and peace at where you are. That's when you're most likely to to see a partner shows up who is living at a similar level of understanding as you uh, and is therefore attracted to where you're at. I love this passage, uh, Paul, from Quest of the Pearl, where it's on page 110 where Mama Leela is speaking, the, the character in the book that is meant to represent Sid is speaking to uh, the, to the student, Richard. And it's very near the end of the book. And Richard is exp experiencing two things, a moment of sadness that his first wife has died and that he's alone, but also a, a profound awareness that Mama Leela, who also had the experience of losing her beloved partner, is um, is at peace with that. And he says, but her loss came without even one complaint. On the contrary, she expressed only love and gratitude. And then she senses his discontent or his, his Ill, lack of ease at the moment. And she turns to him and she says, you are a young man and have a long life ahead of you, I am sure someday, soon, you will find a beautiful Wahini woman to share your world. Standing up, Mama Leela lifted her arms toward the sky and said, and this just brings tears from to me, throw your dreams and hopes to the heavens above. If you believe in them strongly enough, some day the great one will sprinkle his aloha over them and bring them to life for you. And there are two things about that passage that always strike me when I read it. One, one is exactly what Natasha is pointing to, that that beautiful feeling of love and contentment, that beautiful feeling of okayness with where you are and seeing the sacredness and the beauty wherever you are, uh, it, it, it is the, the feeling behind the hopes and wishes that makes the difference. 
because if your soul is sending a, what Dick, I've heard Dick and call a love letter, which I love that, that, that it's time to welcome someone into your life. It's time to welcome someone to share your love with and, and you throw that hope out. I truly do believe that, that those dreams come to life from that feeling. I know that when my first husband died, um, there, it was three years before I met Bill. And I, I, the first year after, I was in pretty deep grief. And then I began slowly to find my way in life as a, as a young widow with a daughter and, and got to a place where I was really like grooving it. Like, wow, you know, I feel good again. And I'm happy and I'm content. And, and somehow this loss has become part of the fabric of my being. And so I don't suffer it anymore. And, oh, man, in that place of contentment and in that place of not, not clinging to that, but just embracing it, really experiencing the sacredness of it, I started to have this thinking, it would be really nice to have someone to have dinner with again. And that was, I don't, I didn't experience that as thought from my little brain. It was like, it was like this, it's like, it wasn't even a longing. It was just like a knowing that I was ready. And bang, there was Bill. I think there's something in there for all of us to look at, whether it's a partner or some other desire that's coming straight up from the soul, that the, the answer is, is to not be afraid to dream it and then to be in that silent mind again to allow it, allow, allow what will happen to unfold. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The part that resonated the most for me is when you, the first thing that it's the, ha the habit of the mind looking outward and it's looking in the wrong direction. And just remembering that takes the charge out of the whole thing for me. Mm. Uh, those were beautiful, beautiful, beautiful answers. Thank you both. You're welcome. Any other questions out there? I see there are a few hands raised. And then there, I think there was a question in the chat. Do you have both have time to go on for maybe 15 more minutes? Okay. Yes. Sure. So Deborah, how about if you go next? Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks to both of you for being here today. Um, I have two totally unrelated questions. Um, the first one was early when you were talking, Natasha, about us not being broken. And it kind of occurred to me, people talk about a broken spirit, and I wonder what you think they mean by that, and if you think that's possible. Um, and then my second question is about love. I, I have this sense that love is another name for God or the divine, it's just a, a, another way that we try to put form to the formless, and I wonder what you think about that, too. Should I try with the first one, Linda? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I know that you can speak about it beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, spirit, what's spirit? You know, spirit is, is formless. So just like the space in this room cannot be broken, the spirit cannot be broken. I know we say that, and what we usually mean by that is people are feeling depressed or anxious or sad, or there's the, the, the feelings can certainly be, um, it, it feels um, horrible, I feel broken, I, and we'll, people will say that in, in, in their language. But that's pointing towards something that comes and goes. Even the people I work with who, who suffer from depression, there are times where they where they're not depressed even for a moment. So when we look to, to the formless, there's nothing, how are you gonna break a form? Spirit is formless. So, so, so to me, spirit cannot be broken. We use it as uh, like in words, but when we start seeing that, that who we are is truly formless, beautiful, divine, then we start realizing that, that we cannot be broken. This, this, it's just not possible. 
doesn't mean that we don't um, sometimes we'll also say we have a broken heart. Well, the heart can't break either. Mm -hmm. You certainly feel that way. And I certainly know that feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Yeah, Sid, Sid Banks would point to, he'd say that if, if the thought system is jammed, uh, what will what will ex what will experience is a feeling of life being stuck or things being stuck or things being broken, and so when people say that to me, I certainly know that I had been at a time where I felt that before I knew anything about the three principles and could understand that oh, just my thought system that's a little jammed up here. Of course, of course, the spirit can't be broken. But it can feel in that in that jammed place pretty inaccessible mm -hmm. because it feels so real. The illusions can feel so real. So that's one of the three principles understanding to me is it helped me see the logic of what was happening so that I don't get so frightened by that anymore. It's like, oh, okay, that's all this is is momentarily, you know, I kind of gummed up the works. So. <laughs> Accidentally, <laughs> and I just want to go back to that silent mind and see what comes up. The other thing I I think um, is that a lot of times when we feel most stuck, to me, is when something from wisdom is 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 really mm -hmm. starting to come through. And I don't know if, if you've ever um, if you've ever sat on a beach ball in a pool or a uh, in the ocean, it takes a lot of energy to sit on it and to not have it come out, you know, so you got to kind of keep doing this and doing that. And then eventually it dumps you off and <laughs> the water. I think of depression as being a lot like that metaphor that, that when we're, when we're trying to hold back something that is coming through, it takes a tremendous amount of energy. And Boy, but as soon as we get out of its way, we're out of the stuckness. That's it's so wise and so powerful to have a reminder. Yeah. Yeah. And you had a two-part question. I lost the second one. Can about you love. About oh, love. Yeah. About the, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. That it's another word for for the formless or God or the divine, all the different all the different words we use to try to describe that. And Sid, I think, talked pretty clearly in a couple places about the, the principles being a metaphor for love. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. There was one more person. Yeah, Jennifer. Hi there. I hope I can put words to the question because it's I'm not quite sure how to put it out there, but I, I noticed I'm getting a bit tangled up with um let's call it my ego that I'm I'm noticing my natural state when I'm with less thought and I just feel very loving and I don't know, the whole world is different. And like for example, on a day like today, um I can just see it's very self-centered thinking. Um very limiting thought and and then i i go into this um pitfall of feeling like i'm dr jekyll and mr hyde like you know like the is is the ego me is it not me is it a bad thing that i'm you know what i mean like it's just stirring up a lot of thought on it and i'm just wondering if you can speak to that in there do you want to <laughs> but, you know what? No, it, it, you know it's so funny. What came to mind was uh, there's a place where Sid says, "Everything you everything you think the ego is, it isn't." <laughs> and, and I just get tickled by the humor of that. Uh, that 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 I experienced that too, Jennifer. I had a moment yesterday where I got I actually got off a call and man, something happened, and I was just in a really low spot, just wanted to be left alone. And I, I think the beauty 
for me is that now I didn't try to spend any time analyzing it or figuring out. I just knew that a thought, something powerful, had danced, was dancing through my body, and so I was having these sensations. But if I just left it be, it would pass pretty quickly. And I don't, I don't, I, I when I've honestly, Jennifer, when I first started to see that, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm kind of bipolar. Right? Yeah, I'm going back and forth between these different states. And then now I just see, oh my gosh, I was, I'm human. <laughs> I'm human. That's life. I don't expect that that's going to completely stop until, until I do flatline. Hmm. But, but I'm not afraid of that anymore. I don't put a lot on that anymore. Think a lot about that anymore. It's just, uh, it's just a momentary experience dancing through and, and that's okay. It's just part of being, it's part of having this equipment through which I'm experiencing all of life. But I used to make a big deal of that. And then I could make all that stuff that came with it go on for days and days. <laughs> I think that's what I'm doing is I'm making a big deal of it. And then it's be it's more and more real. And then it's, who am I? And yeah, just a lot of thought getting stirred up on it. There's, a, there's an old, old tape from way back when Sid was first teaching in the basement of a church, I think. Kind of hard to hear, but he tells this little story that tickles me about how he and his buddy went to the lunch in the plant where they were working. And Sid got up to the serving person and said, I'd like some chili. And I, this may not be 100% accurate, but the lady gave him chili. And then his buddy next to him behind him said, I'd like some chili too. And the lady said, well, I'm sorry, but you can't have any chili. Sid got the last bowl of chili, but we have this really nice fish. And the man said, but I don't want fish. And there was this conversation back and forth about he didn't want fish. And she's saying, that's all I have. So finally he takes fish and Sid says he came back to the table and he grumbled for the whole 45 minutes about the fact that he didn't get fish and Sid got the last bowl of chili. And then Sid starts laughing. And he said, but what was really funny is that the next day we got in the line and for the 15 minutes we were standing in the line, the men was still talking about the fact that yesterday he didn't get chili, he got fish. And when I heard that story, I just started laughing and laughing and laughing because I thought I saw that I did that all the time that I had an experience and then I just keep making it bigger and bigger by thinking about it, talking about it, going back to it. And that that was optional. I didn't have to do that. And, and not doing it relieved a lot of suffering. Thank you. I just wanted to say sort of, you know, with what we're speaking about, um, whether we call it having a silent mind, what are we looking for? Whatever we're looking for, if we're looking in the world of form, it's like we're, we're, it's like the ocean, the, the wave looking for the ocean. <laughs> we're looking for that which we are. Mm. Mm. So when the wave is looking for something, where, where, where is the ocean? Where did it go? It's, it's who we already are. And I think that's so beautiful to know. It helps us through those be times where we're just humans, but we're human beings and the being part is, 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 is important to realize that we are already that. So I wanted to thank everyone. Lovely being with you, Linda, again. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Always. really sweet. And thank you, Bonnie, for hosting and thanks everyone for, for coming today. And it's a privilege to spend time with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Linda and Natasha. This was truly a beautiful conversation. Um, I realized when you said in the beginning of the call that you were um, you did a webinar right around this time as well. How appropriate because you're talking about love and tomorrow's Valentine's Day. And I just, I just want to um, remind everybody that the next webinar is March 15th, and it's with Brianne Grable, who is a new um, registered 3PGC practitioner. So looking forward to hearing from her. So thank you, everyone, for joining us live, and everyone who's going to listen. <laughs> bye thank bye. you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye.